Good evening. Good evening. Okay, let's try that again. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, that's more like it. Hi, my name is Ezra Cologne, and I am thrilled and honored to uh, welcome you to tonight's performance of the Telling Project Albuquerque 2018. What you're about to see is a project two years in the making, and again, we are thrilled that you could join us here tonight for this experience. Just a few uh, announcements before we begin. First, I'd like to thank our sponsors and donors for Full List in your program, who without this show, their support, this show, all season long, our shows, would not be possible. I'd like to take just a couple of uh, seconds here to give a special shout out to Payday HCM, the Scott Family Foundation. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. And I'd like to give a special shout out to our lead sponsors for this show, New Mexico Arts and the National Endowment for the Arts for their generous support of live theater here in Albuquerque. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. Please silence any cell phones or elect any electronic devices uh, that emit any kind of sound or light that are not literally keeping you alive as not to disturb the actors on stage or any audience members around you. Several of the veterans you will see here tonight are visual artists. They would like to cordially invite you to the New Mexico Veterans Arts Showcase this coming Friday, November 9th, at the Fine Arts Gallery at the New Mexico Expo at 6 p.m. You're not going to want to miss it, trust me. Lastly, Duke City Rep, our mission statement is to serve the audience, and that is you all. We, if you like what you experience here tonight, please let us know. If you don't like what you experience here tonight, please let us know. You can leave a review on Facebook, Yelp, TripAdvisor. You can send us a message on Twitter or Instagram. Or you can send us a direct email at info at dukecityreptheater.com. And with that, I'm going to get out of your way. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And please enjoy The Telling Project. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, then. Okay, let's go. I was a student at Western University in Silver City, New Mexico, taking more than a full load. It wasn't working out. I was called twice to Albuquerque to take a physical for the military. On my third visit, I joined. I joined on the 120-day extension plan. That way I could finish the semester there in Silver City. I was born in Moline, Illinois, one of eight children, none of whom graduated high school. Up until the age of 13, I grew up in the Nebraska countryside. I then moved down to Florida, and I worked shrimp boats out in the Gulf. We'd go out for 12, 14 hours a day, come back in, eat raw oysters, drink beer, and go right back out again the next morning. It was really hard work. Just before I turned 17, a friendly judge gave me the opportunity to either go into service or go to jail. So I went back to Nebraska so that my parents could sign my army enlistment papers. 1974, I took the physical for the Navy. I admitted to having menstrual cramps. They failed me for it. Of course, that's when I learned you don't have to be honest about everything. So I came home in tears and my mother said, well, why don't you try the Coast Guard? I was like, what's that? Turned out it was the first year Coast Guard was taking women on active duty. They were the last service to accept women on active duty. Congress mandated them. In 1968, I graduated from high school six months early on a Friday. On Monday morning, I was in college in the middle of Manhattan. I got cast in a show in the college's theater program and did nothing with school. Not the best decision of my life. If I recall, I got four D's and a C, and the following semester wasn't any better, and I got dropped from college. Vietnam was happening, 
1968 was a very heavy time. If you just floated around and got nothing done, you were bound to get drafted. My home life wasn't very good. I had little parental guidance. I thought, maybe Island List, it'll help get me straightened out, get me away from this environment that I'm in. I come from the country. There's really not much for us to do. I have a great friend of mine, Luisel Navarrete, retired military, great first sergeant. I remember he went in. And you know what? I also wanted to do. I want to serve my country also. I was in Young Marines when I was a kid, and I've always been a visual artist. I got to the point in my artistic practice where I could draw or paint anything I could imagine, and I had absolutely nothing to say. When I'd watch the news, I didn't know what to believe. I wanted a world experience to give me a voice. I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps for artistic inspiration. <laughs> and my recruiter thought I was insane. Little did I know, he was right. When you first get there, it's two days of hurry up and wait. You're processing in, getting haircuts, not these kind of haircuts, but bald head haircuts before you actually go in. Then they put you in a cattle truck where they drive you around and around and around to make sure that you're lost. Of course we're lost. We've never even been there. Finally, you get to the barracks. Get off! Get off! Get off my bus! Hurry up! You got 30 seconds to 20 Move it! Move it! Move it! Come on, move it, everyone! Today, privates! Move Line it! Line up! Line up! Up, Chan Hut! At that moment, we're like, fuck this shit. We hate this. Why the hell did we sign up? What the hell is wrong with me? I was really lost. You know you're supposed to do what you're told. You know you're in for an experience. You're constantly on the edge, waiting, wondering, when's it going to happen? You go from being a high school kid to being part of this organization where you're no longer a civilian. You're no longer in a democracy. When we first learned how to march, we were taught ditties. Ditties are phrases you repeat after a command that help you remember the movement. We used ditties for a couple of weeks and then did away with them. Ditties are for babies for boots, for recruits. Marines know the movement and don't use ditties. Well, it was near graduation and I don't know what came over me, but my drill instructor said, right flank, and I was the single voice that called out the old ditty, 1500, halt! She was pissed. Who said that? I said who the fuck said that? This recruit, ma'am. Does that mean you want me to punch in your face? Might help, ma'am. She held in a laugh and quickly turned around to hide it and got right back to marching us. Left face! My drill instructors were amazing women. They were like real life comic book superheroes. Pure muscle, all power, perfect Marines. Nothing at all like the goofy mess I was. But my favorite part of boot camp was learning how to fire my weapon. And when I first started, my instructor said, Neely, you're more fucked up than a football bat. I was blind as a bat, too. But they had me a sharpshooter before graduation. Firing your weapon is sacred. You learn that your rifle is an extension of your body, a machine that operates and responds to your every breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. Pay attention. There is a silent pause between breaths. A single moment in which your body is completely still. You breathe in, and you pull out all the trigger slack, then breathe out. In that moment of stillness before you take your next breath, that's when you fire. When I got to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for basic training, they put us in old World War II barracks. Company punishment well, was a big field of crushed gray rock, spray painted green on top. The company punishment was a little can of green paint, a little brush. You would get down on your hands and knees and you start crawling across that crushed rock, painting the gray spots green that had been turned over during the day. Once you got to the other side, you discovered that you yourself had turned over more gray spots. So you turned around and went right back in the other direction. 
It was kind of a never-ending punishment. And it didn't take me too long to realize it was easier to follow instructions than it was to have repeated sessions with that little can of green paint. It also taught me that I'd rather be the one giving the orders than taking them. Fall in! Left, right, face! Mark time, march! Left, 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 right, left, 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 right, left. On my first day in boot camp, I learned the first of many important lessons. The Coast Guard was the first service to have integrated companies, so the women would meet up at the men's barracks. As I was running back to my own barracks, I failed to salute the company commanders of three companies in formation. Picture this. I'm a 120-pound little girl. I've got these three huge men hanging over me, screaming at me from all sides. And all I could do was stand there and take whatever they were giving me, close my eyes, and said, I'm not going to cry, I'm not going to cry, I'm not going to cry. Then I went back to the barracks climbed up on the, the shelf over top of the sink and cried for 20 minutes. But I never let them see me cry. Company, halt! Left face. Parade, rest! Snap! The only book we were allowed was a Bible. I'm an atheist. I was the only atheist in my platoon. We had the option not to go to church. I was the only recruit who didn't go. So they called me the heathen. I brought my favorite book to boot camp with me, and on it I wrote, this is my Bible. Please don't take it away from me. They rolled their eyes, but they didn't take my book away. It was Zen in the Martial Arts by Joe Hyams, a student of Bruce Lee. It helped me mentally prepare for combat. Bruce Lee said, the mind is like a fertile garden. It will grow anything you wish to plant, beautiful flowers or weeds. And so it is with successful, healthy thoughts or with negative ones that will, like weeds, strangle and crowd the others. Do not allow negative thoughts to enter your mind, for they are the weeds that strangle confidence. When it really kicked in for me was when Buddy Miles was planning to go AWOL. I remember sitting down and talking to him. Brother, this shit sucks. I know it sucks. We all think this shit sucks. But we're in this together. We're brothers, right? Right. At that moment, I started to realize that I was becoming a soldier, that I was becoming a leader. I actually helped someone. Basic training, Fort Bliss, Texas, was an education of survival. It was hard. But I was quite athletic in high school, wrestling, football, baseball. The bayonet training, the hand-to-hand -hand combat, the personal protection of any kind of blast, whether it be a gas attack or a nuclear attack. The education was quite needed. I took it as a game, but I'd done my best. The reality check came when I used it for life. Company, can't hunt! Right, hey! Forward, mark! Company, pull! Left, hey! Eddie, dismiss. I went through basic training and then about three months of tech school where I learned communications, which is nothing like there is now. That was teletype. That stuff that comes out in the paper strips, we actually learned how to read those stops. I learned cryptography at a high security level and I got assigned to Kelly Air Force Base, Security Hill, San Antonio, Texas. 
I was there about seven or eight months, and I remember getting a high priority flash message about one of the security services posts in Vietnam taking a direct hit on its comm center. And a guy got killed in that rocket attack doing the same work that I did. In fact, he was the only one in the 6924th Security Squadron who ever got killed in Vietnam. I received my orders to Vietnam right after. It might have just been coincidental, but it always felt like I was replacing this guy who just got killed in a comm center somewhere in Vietnam. Being young and pretty naive, I never even had any thoughts about death or getting killed in a war. I was going to be working in a comm center. The only training they had me go through was M16 training, and I was the worst because my eyesight sucked. It still does. I couldn't see the target. The guys on the firing line around me all had more hits on their target than the amount of ammo they had because of me. But that never prevented me from going. The truth is, in the year I was there, I never once touched a weapon. May of 70, we went out by way of Hawaii and Okinawa. On the flight going out, everyone was quiet, apprehensive. Arriving in Da Nang, the thing that most struck me, being a 19-year-old kid, was that in the Da Nang airport terminal, there were women breastfeeding their kids. It was something you didn't see back in New York in those days. That that picture stuck in my head. And it really wasn't much of a terminal. It was more of a clearing place for American military coming to or leaving Vietnam, or for the flyboys going out on their missions. And it wasn't fancy by any stretch of the imagination. I was a shift worker. Comp Center was open 24 hours. We were 12 on and 12 off, and then every couple of weeks we got some time off or something like that. I was one of the people who ran the Comp Center. Basically, we sent out messages when we got them from officers or whoever. We, top secret ones, we received messages, we distributed them, we used all this cryptography for those messages that required a high degree of security. Happened all the time. There were always messages coming in and messages going out. And the comm center was really nothing more than a small mobile type of unit. When working through the night and being alone, your imagination ran wild and you dreaded the sirens alerting you to an incoming attack. We, we would huddle in corners. We would hope for sleep. We would hope for no attacks that night and we waited for the relative safety that the sunrise would bring. At Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Aberdeen, Maryland, I was trained in all phases of welding, military occupation specialists, Army Talk MOS 44C20. What did that mean? Welder blacksmith. That school lasted 11 weeks. The military didn't know what to do with me, so they had me making propaganda movies. There at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, they had a large Viet Cong village set up, and we were to attack it and kill gooks. I didn't have a speaking part, but I'd done a lot of running with a weapon in my hand. Then they found a place for me in West Germany, a small community called Forsheim where I worked as a welder in a Persian missile unit. I married a European. She's English, not German. And the Tet of 68 happened nine days after the wedding. They gave me 48 hours to clear the post. So I left my wife Lillian in West Germany and kissed goodbye, see you later. I came here to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and signed in at the Curtin Air Force Base, not intending to go AWOL, but I was seeking a hardship waiver. It didn't come. So I got orders for Seattle, Washington, Fort Lewis. There I spent three weeks under some type of orientation. Then orders came for Vietnam. 
Seattle, Washington, Anchorage, Alaska. From Anchorage, Alaska to Japan. From Japan to Cameron Bay. I didn't believe in failure. And I couldn't quit like some guys. I discovered that it didn't hurt to be hollered at. Regardless of how many times someone got up in your face screaming at you, it didn't hurt. It was designed to do one of two things. It would either, over a period of time, cause you to quit, or it would cause you to develop an attitude. The attitude I developed was simple. You can't make me quit. And that's important because someplace down the road, you're going to get to a point where you just can't go any further. You don't have anything left to give. And that's when the attitude comes in. Because at that point, when you can't do anything else, you take one more step. And after that, one more step. How far can you go? All depends on you and your willpower. My first trip to Vietnam was in 1965-66. I was a 20-year-old squad leader, recently graduated from the Ranger course, and directly responsible for the lives of 12 other men, 20 years old. After being wounded twice, I was back to the States. While I was in the States, I pushed my body and I pushed my mind, and I earned a GED. In 1968, I volunteered to go back again. This time, as I healed, I earned a two-year degree. Volunteered again in 7071. This time, wounded, but none so serious that I couldn't refuse to be a vet. And why would I do that? Well, pretty simple. I didn't want to leave my troops in the hands of someone else who might not be as good a leader as I was. And I was good. It's all the mantle of responsibility that any good leader has to develop. Say, you are responsible for every single thing your troops do or don't do. And if you're going to demand they face the fires of hell, you damn well better be ready to lead them there yourself. It's simply that mantle of responsibility. We sat around smoking. I smoked like a chimney in those days. By this point, I was a sergeant. When we had some time off, we'd go to the NCO club to drink and listen to music. They had these live bands there they brought in from the Philippines who would sing all the popular American songs with this heavy, heavy accent that the GIs just made fun of. I remember going to the South China Beach, which was just an area of the South China Sea that was set aside for GIs. And the funny thing about that beach, there were no women there. Are you shitting me? <laughs> Just guys. The occasional French nurses who steered clear of the GIs. A unique, beautiful, beautiful beach. You'd go in the water and you could see all the way to the bottom. It was crystal clear. But it was really just a matter of getting away, feeling like a, a human being again. And then there was this little room within the barracks where when we weren't working, we'd sit up all night and play cards and the music would be going. And then the sirens would go off and you'd hear the rocket explosions and you'd hit it! The whole idea behind that is when the rockets come in, they go like this. So if you're down here, less chance of getting hit by shrapnel. And then they would sound the all clear. All clear! And we'd get back up and pick up the cards and keep on playing. No one counted their money. It was an honor system. And 
But there was this area outside the barracks where they showed movies. And if you weren't watching the movies, you were watching this light show, which actually were our helicopters and gunships firing on the areas surrounding the base. Red streams of light that looked fascinating until you remembered what they were made of and the damage that they did. On the other side, the Viet Cong fired into the base all the time. We'd sit in our chairs, lean back, drink our beer, and watch. Always careful for the Marines across the road from our squadron who, when they had a few drinks in them, would party by firing their M16s into the air. As strange as it may seem, I never remember feeling scared. I will never forget flying out. We get on this Pan Am airliner, it's all military, and I remember it goes down the runway and goes straight up. Because you didn't fly over the territory, you'd get shot down. It goes as high as it can, as quickly as it can. And then everybody on the plane starts hey! 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 And finally, finally, we sit back, relax, and take a deep breath. I remember taking a red eye from LA to New York. And, and there weren't very many people on the plane, so they put me in first class. And there were only two other people in first class, one of those people being Mama Cass, with a partner who slept the whole time. I spent five hours flying from LA talking to Mama Cass. She, she asked me about the war. She wanted to know about the experience, what it was like over there. She never took this negative anti-war attitude. She wasn't stuffy or stuck up in any way. And when I got off the plane in New York, my family never saw this rock star. They were so focused on me. And then I was home. I arrived in Cameron Bay aboard the Flying Tiger, a civilian aircraft, well over 200 personnel aboard, and I don't know a soul. First thing that hits you is the 110 degree heat, the 90 plus humidity. And they called us into formation on the tarmac, simply because the terminal was rocketed and mortared the night before. And I heard this sergeant call out, I need 10 volunteers. I want you, and you, and you, and you. I was one of the youths. They handed us body bags. They took us into the terminal, picking up body parts, legs, arms. That was the most trying situation. After the puking, the crying, and the shakes, I had to pull myself together and say, this is a war zone. Shit's going to happen. And it did. It happened. 610 Air Transport was my home, my base duty station. Eight miles north of Da Nang was a helicopter maintenance. I worked closely with the machine shop and the turbine engine rebuilding shop. We worked on all types of helicopters. But the most common one was the Huey. Busted up landing skids, shot up fuselages. The little loaches, they're the ones that took a beating. On quiet days, we'd sit in a welding shop and weld up exhaust manifolds. At the time, I was running with a fellow from Hawaii, Frank Anchetta. No, 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 no. bro. What's up, buddy? Let's do. <laughs> we'd drink a lot of beer, get drunk and then go skinny dipping Woo! in the ocean. He was teaching me how to body surf. We was out a good 200 yards offshore, and out of the dark came the largest turtle I've ever seen. Ooh, scared the hell out of me. He's bigger than a Volkswagen. I was thinking to myself, I'm a desert rat. Get me back to shore. I don't need this. We didn't have liquor license, but we did have beer permits, and we could keep them in the pooches. This one particular day, 
after leaving the company formation, walking to our duty station, here's this lonely PFC in the back with his hands in his pockets, just straggling along. And then he said, I feel like fucking somebody up today. And he pulled a pin on the hand grenade and threw it in our group. I was in the vicinity, so I started rendering first aid. People were a mess. No legs, no arms. Their faces were gone. That was the most trying time for me. Some days in now were bad. I was wounded five times, not counting assorted shrapnel wounds. I was on two Hueys that were shot down by RPGs. I was in several intense firefights, like LZ X-Ray. I saw the inside of a body bag. It stinks. And it's scary as hell when you wake up in one. I was captured and tortured, and luckily I escaped. I received awards for valor, but in my mind, they were paid for by the blood and the heroism of other guys who didn't come back. Funny things happen too. You'd hear a couple of guys in the middle of a firefight harassing and razzing each other. Anything to make the insanity go away for just a couple minutes. You learn how hard combat is. Losing one man or 10 and how those losses stay with you for the rest of your life. Ever after, you're left wondering, was there anything else I could have done? And there's no answer. You deal with it, and you live with it. You see things you wish you hadn't seen. Innocence caught in the middle of a crossfire a 12-year-old girl, raped over and over again, and then mutilated in front of her father. Why? Because he refused to pay their damn taxes. I guess one of the most important things you learn is just how inhumane humans can be towards one another. My first duty station after Radium in school was Radio Station Guam. I was a Morse code operator. Radio Station Guam was a very small station. We only had a few circuits. A 500 kilohertz Morse code international distress and calling frequency was considered a slow circuit. Thank God, because my copying skills were mediocre at best, and I could just barely keep my head above water. The guys at the station treated me okay, but there was a lot of inappropriate comments, sexual innuendos, and outright discrimination. I don't think the guys thought too much about it. It's just the way it was. The Coast Guard had been an all boys club for so long, and they hadn't gotten used to, they weren't that anymore and they needed to start minding their P's and Q's a little bit. A good example was the guys, the, the Coast Guard Code of Basswood had gone to the Philippines and they had gone on Liberty and along the Post City. They decided it would be really funny to send me a pair of used hookers panties. I was horrified. Now for those of you who don't know what along the Post City is, it's a liberty port that sailors think is heaven on earth. Every depraved thing you can think about sex goes on there. And many things you can't even talk about in mixed company. It might have been funny from one guy to another, or to one sailor to another, but not sent to a woman. Talk about a Me Too moment. Shortly after I, got, I arrived on the island, I was able to buy a car. It was a classic Guam bomb. Came equipped with holes in the floor and a whole colony of roaches. I loved it. 
I could go anywhere I wanted on the island. Nobody bothered me. I could be myself. It took me a while to learn that I couldn't be socially friends with the guys at my station. It came down to what they thought they could get off me, i.e. in bed. And about six months before I left, I left Guam, I was raped by one of my shipmates. It took me 17 years to understand I'd been raped. I was on the Central Park Jogger Trial in 1990, and that was the first time I'd ever heard the actual definition of rape. But in 1976, they didn't tell you about date rape. It was just something they didn't talk about. I have never forgotten his name, and I've never told anybody who it was. And I remember every second of the attack. My next duty station was Coast Guard Headquarters. Coast Guard Headquarters was a very good station. In fact, I did a second tour there. Uh, the, the guys were a lot older, more mature, much more senior to me. I enjoyed the work, but even though I was only 50 miles from home, I'm from Baltimore, um, I was working in an office. And I didn't join the military to work in an office. When I graduated boot camp, the ratio of female to male Marines was 1 to 200. I had no idea what I was about to face. I wish that I had had better guidance back then. Somebody to say, hey, don't let the guys get to you. One of my drill instructors tried to prepare us for it. Before graduation, she sat us all down and she said, I want you guys to know that when you get out there, the men are going to think of you as either a bitch or a whore. Or a hoe. She said they were the only two choices the men would give us. I had no idea what she meant. It was really hard being a female because there was always the sense that you were doing something wrong. And it was distracting being a female because so many of the guys wanted to sleep with you. Once you're deployed to a base offshore, you become like an endangered species. Somebody's always staring at you. Every male knows your name. I was stationed in Okinawa. We were doing squad rushes and my knee dislocated and the opposite direction. This was right before we went to Fuji. Often if you were injured, you were punished. So to punish me, they put me to work in the kitchens. In the kitchens, I was surrounded by grunts, Marine Corps platoons who have no females. They hadn't seen a female in I don't know how long. It was like being a walking piece of meat among wolves. When the women in my platoon were out training, I was left alone in the squad bay, and I was raped. When they returned, they found me laying in a cold shower. I don't know what happened to me. I don't remember. I had carved the word no into my arm. They carried my shivering body out of the shower and wrapped me in a towel. We should have reported it, but none of us knew who to turn to, and all of us were afraid that we'd be in even more trouble if they found out what happened to me. So they went and got the guy I was dating at that time, and he carried me in a towel off to an empty barracks and fucked me again. And afterward, he said, I just didn't know how else to make you feel better. In 1977, Coast Guard sent out the word that they were looking for women volunteers to go to sea. I threw my name in the hat. Several months later, I became one of the first women stationed on a combat ship. And on October 21st, 1977, I reported on board the Coast Guard Cutter Gallatin, stationed out of Governor's Island, New York. First patrol went pretty good. We didn't really have any problems. But when the ship had uh, reached the sea buoy, heading back into New York Harbor, we were met by a tug that transferred on board a reporter and photographer from the Navy Times. They were gonna do an expose on the first women going to sea. The guys didn't like it very much. In fact, they, a lot of them resented it. And the women weren't wholly welcome when we first went on board anyway. Things, uh, my luck ran out when my current chief radioman uh, transferred out and we received a new, new chief radioman who had actually been a first class I was stationed with on Guam. He didn't like me. In fact, he didn't like women in the Coast Guard and he really didn't like women on his ship. We didn't belong there. I couldn't do anything right. 
He did everything to pick apart everything I did. Uh, it was constantly on my back. I got blamed for things I had no control over. <coughs> A few months later, things went from bad to worse. We had this kid, real piece of crap, Radium, and reported him from Radium in school. He had been busted twice for pot and got back into school a third time. To this day, I haven't figured that one out. Um, but that was before zero tolerance. It's because of that, he couldn't be granted a security clearance immediately when he reported on board. Somebody gave him a classified message to type up back in TSEC where we had all our crypto. And I was a senior radioman, so I went in, took the message from him and said, I'm sorry, you can't, I can't let you have this. Please step back out in Radio Central. He turned around and glared at me. I don't take orders from women. My chief never backed me up. Did nothing about this kid's attitude. In fact, it continued for the next seven, eight, nine months. The chief blamed me for his attitude and his behavior, said it was my fault. I kept telling the chief that there was something wrong with him. He's the only person I was ever actually afraid of in the Coast Guard, physically afraid of. I didn't go out on deck at night alone because he might've thrown me over the side if he was out there. And they wouldn't have discovered I was gone until the next day when they had mustard. But in the end, a year after I left, he was court-martialed on attempted murder charges. He had already done time in the brig, or what we call the Marine Hotel, uh, for attempted rape. Talk about karma. There were good times, too. There were a lot of good times. My last patrol in the Gallatin, my last patrol in the Gallatin, they had us uh, send us to St. Thomas to fight a fire on the 70, uh, 970 foot passenger liner, the Angelina Laura. Burned, gutted, sunk at the pier in St. Thomas. We had round the clock fire parties, and I took several fire parties in by myself. A whole week. Nobody criticized what I did. They appreciated what I did. I felt like I really accomplished something. This is what the Coast Guard's all about, you know, doing something. To this, I received a letter of accommodation from my captain. And to this day, I still say my time on the Gallatin was among my best and my worst times in the Coast Guard. I was trying to focus, just trying to do my job. There are so many things I don't remember. Twice I woke up in the hospital on another base with no idea how I got there or why I was there. I was a good Marine. I had a lot of respect for my fellow Marines. But why was nothing said? It's common that whatever issues, whatever problems you're having, you're not encouraged to talk. You just don't want to be the weak link. After Okinawa, I deployed to Iraq. We were hit within 30 minutes of landing. When it happened, I was completely calm. It was surreal. It was like being on a movie set. We had just been assigned to our sleeping quarters and I had taken off my boots when the mortar landed. The clearest thought that rang through my head was, air is my sock. I put my boots back on and waited for the ground to stop shaking. I felt the door to see if it was hot. I cracked it open. We went to the main tent and got accountability. Nobody was hurt, we were very lucky. Soon after that, they gathered all the females together. There were about eight of us and they said, we just had six rapes reported in the last week, so don't be alone. This is inside the wire. I just remember thinking, I'm one of the only fiber optic technicians. I'm going to have to go repair lines. I'm going to end up alone. My attitude after that was just ready to defend myself. I was ready to kill 24 seven, condition one behind the wire thinking, I'm gonna have to kill another Marine. Fiber optic cables are made of glass. They're strands of glass thinner than a human hair. In a combat zone, it's common for that glass to shatter, even with Kevlar casing. When that happens, you have to locate the break, strip it back, and cut the line. Then you have to melt the glass ends together, and you have to get it as perfect as you possibly can, or you'll have signal loss. So in the middle of the desert, in a sandstorm, with a Marine holding a poncho over us to keep the dust off, 
I had to manually line them up under a microscope and use the fusion splicer to fix the break in the lines. That was the coolest thing I ever did. In the military, you get three choices. You get three choices where you want to go. I wanted somewhere in Texas. I wanted Fort Hood. When I first got to Fort Hood, they said, Congratulations, you're being deployed. And I went on my first deployment. I was young. I was excited. I was ready. I was gun holding. I remember the Humvees, rallies, Humvee, rally, Humvee, rally. The first 50 miles, we have no action, no nothing. Then we actually hit the border. And I remember they started firing at us, and we started firing back. Doo, 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 doo. It was nothing like what we trained. We trained with blanks. This time around, you can actually hear the bing, bing, bing. You can actually feel the heat of the bullet past your head. After that, I don't remember. I just know that they had the equipment. But they didn't have our kind of training, nor did they have our firepower. They trained us. They trained us to be hard. They trained us to shoot. They trained us to kill, show, you know. But the damage that our rallies and tanks did, innocent people dying, kids getting hurt, they didn't transfer that shit. They didn't train us to see families and kids begging for water, food. Some of the fathers were trying to give us their daughters and, you know, for food and water in exchange. That threw us off. Shit, I couldn't even believe it. Fifteen months after our first deployment, we went back to Fort Hood. You know what we did? We started drinking. Some of us didn't want nothing to do with anybody. Of course, people were praising us and, you know, making us feel like we're heroes. But we knew what we saw. We knew what we did. That could not be erased. We deployed back in 2006. This time I moved up the ranks. I had my soldiers under me. And I remember we trained them a little differently and talked to them. We told them, hey, you know, y'all gonna be doing things and seeing things you never imagined. Then I messed up. Before we left, we had a big old company barbecue. There was no uniform, there was no rank. Just civilian with our families, moms, dads, kids, wives, husbands. I made a promise. The reason I made this promise is because I had already deployed and I believed in my leadership and I believed in my guys that we, were, we already deployed together before. But I promised I was going to bring them back. Six months into Duania, we're coming back. We're coming back from our mission. The next thing I knew, I was upside down. The next thing I knew, my world was spinning. The next thing I knew, some of my guys, body parts and blood were all over us. The next thing I knew, I felt like someone beat me with a bat. The next thing I knew, I was in Germany. Everyone, for one second, just close your eyes, open them. That's how quick it was. After Nam, I didn't believe that I had any problems. But over a period of time, it becomes a little bit harder to ignore. I didn't want to go out, especially in crowds. I didn't like being bumped into at all. If I didn't talk to somebody for six months, that didn't bother me at all. I was always jumpy. <laughs> I still am. And I didn't understand why other people didn't understand me. And that's not a good sign. I knew it wasn't fair to my family, to my wife, because, see, we got married after now. She didn't know anything about that period. And I didn't know how to talk to somebody 
who hadn't been through the same experiences that I did. So I continued to try and ignore that. Until one day I was standing outside the base exchange and this young lady came up behind me. Thinking I was someone else, she put her hand on my shoulder and jerked me around. To this day, I do not know why I didn't hurt her because as I spun around, all I saw was a bad guy. Scared the hell out of her. So I went to the VA. And I know the VA gets a lot of bad raps, especially the last couple of years. But this regional VA here in Albuquerque is one of the best ones in the nation. I've had 12 surgeries at that hospital. I never once did I not have the best surgeons available or the best treatment after. Be that as it may, a surgeon can't fix PTSD. Can't stick pins in it and have it start working again. The most important thing about PTSD is that you want to have help. When you get to that point, then you have to decide to open your head and let somebody start crawling around in there. It's scary, and I guarantee you it's one of the hardest things you'll ever have to try to do. I filled my guys. Why the fuck was I alive? I hated this world. I wanted to die. I wanted to commit suicide. I remember grabbing the knife and slicing myself right there. I made a promise, and I want to be with them. We're proud to serve our country. We raised our hand. We're grown men and women, unfortunately, Sometimes we gotta do and see things we never imagined. I got stitched up and I reached out for help. I didn't want to be another number, nor did I want to feel sorry for myself. Let's ask for help. Let's get better. I got out right after I got back from my wreck. They begged me to re-enlist, but I was sick and tired of having to prove myself to every single male I worked with. I had no idea how broken I was. My body was no longer my own. When I was home and safe, my body would react to sounds without my permission. A neighbor would slam their door and I'd roll off the couch and take cover under the coffee table. I was up on a ladder painting a mural and a boy walked by whistling and I reacted to his song as though a mortar were falling through the sky. I was like a cartoon character. Car alarms made me angry. Even though I knew what the noise was and I knew it would sound again, I couldn't not jump. I kicked the lights in on somebody's poor truck. Fourth of July was the worst. I heard shots fired and I canvassed the neighborhood with a loaded gun. I nearly shot some kids who were just playing with firecrackers. When I got back home, I put the loaded gun in my mouth and I pulled out all the trigger slack just to see what it felt like. It got me high. It felt so good to know that all I had to do to fix my problems was pull that trigger. I got rid of my gun the next day. I alienated myself from friends and family. I was deeply angry, terribly sad, and I felt completely alone. I wanted nothing to do with anything associated with the military, and I refused to call myself a veteran. I burned my uniforms and my records, and I did not know that I was a mess. It got worse. I committed suicide on December 31st, 2015. It was my birthday, and I didn't want to be around for another year of this shit. I took a bottle of acetaminophen dissolved in liquor and tried to donate my organs. I thought I could do one last good thing. And after I swallowed the poison and believed I would die, <coughs> I felt overjoyed. I walked miles to the VA hospital thinking, excuse me. I walked miles to the VA hospital thinking, 
they could harvest my organs from my corpse by the time I got there. But that's not what happened. A security guard found me and I begged him, I'm trying to die and it's not working, please kill me. He said, no hun, not today. He called the medics and after three days in the ICU, they sent me to the psych ward. It's a place called Ward 7. And I was surrounded by male veterans and I did not want to come out of my room until I heard the most beautiful music coming from outside. I wanted to get close to that music. I finally came out to listen. The man playing was named David, and he welcomed me. He told me his story, and I told him mine, and we both began to heal. Then, one after another, I met my fellow veterans, and we opened up to each other. Together, we broke the silence and found hope that perhaps our lives are still worth living. In the mid-80s, I had a small Chevy S10 pickup with a camper shell. That was my home. I worked for a company that had showers, a restaurant, for a small cafeteria. I maintained living in my home in peace, just doing my pain. Winter was coming. I had to make a decision. So I thought about my parents' home. I'll ask the tenants to leave and I'll move in. I moved in with just a sleeping bag, that's all I had. I slept on the floor, but I was home. I started doodling. I've always drawn and diddled around in the arts. Art is my self-inflicted therapy just to keep from going insane. Hell, I was insane. The insanity of alcoholism, learning more about PTSD, I had to do a lot of soul searching. My saving grace was art. Other than my wife, that's what kept me going. I discovered that I could create something of beauty that never existed before I created it, and that other people actually enjoyed it. It was amazing. It gave me a sense of purpose that I hadn't had in years. It just made sense to me. I believe the Father always has a reason for everything. Whether we understand it, whether we like it, is not the point. The point is, he has a reason, and that's good enough for me. Every time I create a new piece of art and I put my name on it, I realize that it looks a lot better there than it does on a tombstone. After all, because of art, I'm still here, and I'm talking to you because it takes all of you, all of us, to support each other. The truth is, even up to this day, I rarely talk about my military experiences. I was in a Flying Star restaurant one day with my grandchildren, and I'm standing online, and this guy comes up, Sir, thank you for your service. You guys are the real, and he goes on and on. And I'm thinking, is he talking to me? Because I never got this when I came back. I had put all that military stuff aside. But it happens more often now. When I wear my squadron hat, and it still always takes me by surprise. The world is very different now. I am so pleased that even though I may be against wars, at least the military, we're not blamed. Back then, we were blamed. And I finally got those college degrees that I failed at so miserably in 1968 and 1973. 
Thank you, GI Bill. I don't get to DC very often, but I was there a couple of years ago, and we went to the wall. And I wanted to find this guy from the comm center who I thought I had replaced. I had never met this guy, but I was determined to find him. And I found him. It was so sad. It really was sad. I was diagnosed with traumatic brain injury and PTSD. I forget my own phone number. I forget my buddy's name, Sashi Daly. I forget my things I have to do throughout the day. I have my moments, but I'm physically strong. And that's why I love physical work and I love physical activities. Because it reminds me of being an infantryman again. And that's where I feel alive. In 2004, I retired from the reserves. I was recalled to active duty right after 9-11. So I did an additional three years on active duty. 30 years, my 30-year career in the Coast Guard comprised a lot of different things. I worked intelligence, I worked communications, I worked port security. And I was, I was also a civilian security specialist. I joined the Coast Guard for the GI Bill. My parents couldn't afford to send me to college. My life dream had been to be an art teacher, but life kept getting in the way. So when the job that I had come to Albuquerque for didn't work out, I decided it was time to go back to school. I didn't know who I was. The 30 years of my adult life had been the Coast Guard. I didn't know any other language, and I needed to find out who I was. I finished my associates, I completed my Bachelor's of Fine Arts, and last December I finished my Master's in Art Education. I'm currently working on a project that's dedicated to women who died in the service of our country. Women are far too often forgotten. Women serve, women are injured, and women die too. But women have to navigate the male-dominated world of the military. We suffer abuse. We suffer discrimination. We endure. And we keep those scars inside, hidden from the rest of the world. But in the end, men and women who serve speak the same language. We understand each other. As a professional fine artist, I have two monumental sculptures here in the Albuquerque area. One is a life-size bronze honoring the Vietnam veterans. It's at the New Mexico Veterans Memorial of Louisiana, which is outside the Gibson Gate. The other is in the village of Tejedas Canyon Veterans Memorial Park. It's a four foot by eight foot sheet of steel, old glory. During any military conflict, the American people are divided in their thoughts. Oh, glory is torn to distribute the hardship that the, the nation was in. The red and white stripes are separated. One stripe may represent the military population, the other stripe the civilian population. What held our country together was a fine piece of thread. And that was the love of our country from both military and civilian. The stars give the illusion of falling out. That's in honoring that those who died in uniform, the MIAs, POWs. But most of all, those troops that came home and they're living under bridges, they're homeless. They are the true stars. There was a lot of bitterness from the civilian population towards Uncle Sam. That was the era. Those were the times. I'll tell you about my time in the military. It was a million dollar experience that I wouldn't give a dime for, but I'd do it again. I didn't believe that PTSD was real. 
combat stress, shell shock, PTSD, CPTSD, whatever you call it, it's very real. The best way it was explained to me was by a nurse who said that the outer cortex of the brain has become damaged. She said that the outer cortex is a tight web of neurological structures protecting the inner cortex. When you have PTSD, you have something like holes in your outer cortex. So signals that are normally filtered by the outer cortex make it through, straight to the inner cortex, and trigger the freeze, flight, or fight response. I am proof that you can recover from severe PTSD, but living with it is a long and complicated process. I continue to work with a team of specialists at the VA to deal with it. It takes a combination of medication, therapy, and routine counseling to process your past traumas along with your current life. If I could go back in time and talk to the young Marine that was me, I'm trying to figure out what I would tell her. If I can figure out what to say to a young woman in the position I was in, I can heal that way. I don't know what I'd say yet, but I've been thinking about it. Katie Neely, United States Marine Corps. Marty Epstein, United States Air Force. Roy Breckenridge, United States Army Rangers. George Herman, United States Army. Victoria Robillard Briars, United States Coast Guard. George Ua, U.S. Army. 